If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to open them to three different chapters of the book of Hebrews because I'll be reading some portions in those three chapters. Hebrews 7, the first chapter, beginning verse 20. <clears throat> and in as much as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Then let us move to Hebrews chapter 8, <clears throat> reading beginning verse 6. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. And then let us move to Hebrews chapter 12, beginning verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God and judge of all, to the spirit of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of his sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. And all this section speaks of Christ as the Savior of sinners. And so let us again ask the Lord in our continuing study of Christ that He might help us grow in our knowledge and in our relationship with Him. Father, as we continue our meditation upon Your only begotten Son, help us that we may know Him better and better and that our relationship with him will continually grow in accordance to the truth that we are learning from you and be pleased this morning father to grant to us our desire that we may even encounter him who is our Lord and Savior in our study this morning. For this is what we ask in His name. Amen. Doon po sa unang apat na kabanata ng aklat ng Hebreo, the writer basically said that in Jesus Christ we have a better person. Ginamit niya yung mga angels. Sabi niya, Jesus outranks the angels. Binanggit niya si Moses, the great lawgiver, and he said, Jesus is better than Moses. In chapters 5 to 7, the author began to emphasize that Jesus or in Jesus, we have a better high priest. Kumpara doon sa ibang 
mga priest, sila'y mga namatay isa-isa. But Jesus is not coming from that line of priesthood. At dito nga binanggit yung isang mahirap na pag-aralang figure si Melchizedek. A man said who has no beginning and no end. And the author is saying na yung priesthood ni Christ ay doon nag-uugat. But toward the end of chapter 7 in discussing this priesthood and up to chapter 12, there is something we begin to hear about Jesus and this is in relation to what he mentioned here as a covenant. Kung naalala ninyo yung four consecutive studies natin on the promised Jewish Messiah, I hope I have made it clear to you that the New Testament clearly identified that that promised Messiah is no other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of sinners. And so, the basic truth that we learn about our salvation is that our salvation is a person. It's about Jesus Christ and Him alone. But in studying the covenant, I want to show to you in another series of studies that salvation is not only a person, but our salvation is a covenant. In this passage we read, Jesus is presented to us as the surety of a better covenant. He is presented as the mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. The author also mentions that he is the mediator of the new covenant. Salvation is not merely a person. Salvation is a covenant. And we will be considering this topic plus any other questions that arise in understanding the relationship of the promised Messiah to God's covenant. Ano ba ang relasyon ni Jesus na inidentify ng New Testament as the Savior of sinners to God's covenant? Kitang-kita natin na inirelate si Jesus sabihin mang better covenant or new covenant o sabihin man siya yung surety nung covenant na yon, we need to understand what the writer is talking about. At alam natin, yan ay isang malawak na pag-aaral sa salita ng Diyos. But I would approach this study focusing merely on the relationship but in order to do that, kailangan po natin ng background studies. Background studies we need to understand is specifically concerning God's relationship with man. Doon tayo dapat magsimula kasi maraming nagkaroon ng kalituhan even among us who belong to the group mentions as Reformed Baptists in studying Christ's relationship to the covenant because nakakaligta ang pag-aralang mabuti yung mga background studies. And the background studies I will only limit doon sa relationship ng Diyos sa tao na unang itinuro ng malinaw at nireveal sa atin through the book of Genesis. 
And some of you men who are very interested in doing theology, kinakailangan pag-aralan yung mabuti Genesis 1 to 11. Because the many teachings embedded in Genesis 1 to 11 will shape your understanding of who man is and his need and his relationship to God and all the issues being raised, especially in the New Testament, when it comes to the need of such a man of what the Bible calls salvation. Kasi pagka hindi ka maging matibay doon at maging malinaw ka doon sa unang mga pagtuturo ng Diyos patungkol sa kanyang relasyon sa tao, eh mahihirapan ka because through that, doon mo makikita bakit kailangan ng kaligtasan at ano ang relasyon ni Jesus doon sa kaligtasang gustong ipagkaloob ng Diyos sa mga undeserving people na katulad natin? Why have we been mentioned as very undeserving of anything from God? And apart from a real and a growing understanding of that, eh mahirapan tayo. As a pastor, I was, you know, very privileged na nung una akong ma-involve sa mga Reformed Baptists, eh, ang naging teacher ko sa dogmatics ay halos lahat ng elders nung time na yon, nung younger days ko, ng Trinity Reformed Church. Kung sino yung mga teacher nila doon sa academy, yun ang mga naging teacher ko sa doctrine of man, doctrine of Christ, doctrine of salvation, doctrine of the church. And nadiskubri ko sa aking buhay na not much have changed from what I have learned from them, but it only expanded all the more through the years. Narealize ko lang nung inahanda ko itong mga pag-aaral na ito. And so, there are three stages that we would be studying. God's relationship with man in creation, God's relationship with man after the fall, and God's relationship with man in redemption. Kung tayo iligtas na, ano din no, ang relasyon natin kay Jesus with reference to Jesus' relationship to the covenant. Kasi, tuwing buwan-buwan, di ba, we are trying to remember that the shed blood of Jesus Christ was ratified. Di ba? Something was ratified through His shed blood. Ano yun? The new covenant. So, buwan-buwan. Sasagi sa ating isipan yun. Because it is basic to salvation. Salvation is not only a person. The Bible teaches salvation is a covenant. Para maintindihan natin yun, we begin with God's relationship with man in creation. So what is the nature of that relationship? Ang kailangan lang natin, sa ngayon, basahin yung verse 26 and 27 ng Genesis 1, and yung Genesis 5 verses 1 to 3. Doon po sa Genesis 1 verses 26 and 27, a very popular uh, statement, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female, he created them. So don't kitang-kita nyo na, na ang issue doon sa relationship na yon is in the words that man is created in his image, in his likeness, male and female, he created them. In Genesis 5.1, this is the book of the genealogy 
of Adam. So, nung si the summarize yung genealogy ni Adam, sabi dyan, in the day that God created man, He made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. And so that image seems to be the same image in his son. Sabi dito sa Genesis chapter 5. But what is the nature of this original relationship between Adam and God na ang binanggit lang, God, with reference to his relationship with man, ang unang sinabi pagdating sa nature nung man na create niya is that he is in his own image and likeness. So ano sumasagi sa isip nyo? Siyempre, hindi naman physical because God is a spirit. And therefore, the issue whether something physical is involved will never be there. There will be no likeness there. Adam is described as a man created in God's image or likeness. What does it mean? And what kind of relationship is it. So remember, in saying he is the image of God, this verse is not talking about that Adam, the first human being, is a reproduction of God. It's talking about similarities to God. And what are these similarities? Kung malilimit tayo sa aklat ng Genesis, hindi naman ito pinaliwanag sa atin. What are those qualities that distinguish him from the beast that God also created? But Moses made it very evident when God created Adam, He created a creature that was qualitatively different from other creatures. At least yun ang maliwanag. Kasi, kumpara sa ibang creatures, No other creatures was said na they were created in God's image or likeness. The word image and likeness here are used synonymously. Interchangeably, they do not refer to two different things. Image simply means the shadow or the outline of a figure. Likeness denotes the resemblance of the shadow to the, fig- to the figure. So, walang pagkakaiba. But what is this so-called image of God all about? The image of God is more than just a relation of man to creation. Hindi sinasabing, nung sinabi yun ni Moses na, kaya sinabing image of God siya, nire-relate siya doon sa ibang other creation, tinawag siyang image ng God para lang i-differentiate siya sa mga hayo. That is not the primary use kasi sinabi na ng Diyos na nung nag-create siya, they were created in a different level than each one. Kaya nga, itong nandito, hindi pwede umakit. Yung alaman, hindi pwede maging tao. Iba-iba yung kalagayan nila. Because here, it's never that. Hindi naman issue yung bagay na yon The issue here is, it is teaching about God's relationship with Adam. And what is that relationship? God is saying to us that He has a parental relationship to Adam while Adam has a filial relationship with God. To make it short, Adam was God's son. The idea of image-bearing And sonship in the Bible are intimately related. 
So gusto kong ipakita sa inyo how it was used in the Word of God. Now remember, in this original relationship, Adam was God's son bought by creation. Tinatawag theologically natural relationship of Adam to God is that he is God's son by creation. And secondly, spiritually, he is God's son by moral likeness. So yan yung dalawang nakapaloob sa konsepto ng image. The first mention of the image concept na basa na natin is in verses 26 and 27, repeated verbatim almost in verses 1 and 2 of Genesis chapter 5. Pero yung Genesis chapter 5 verse 3 ang mahalaga sa atin, Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. Notice that the idea of image and the idea of likeness is brought into the most intimate and explicit connection with parenthood and sonship. I hope you see that in the verse. He begot Adam, who is the image of God, begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. Adam begot a son who was his image and likeness. Image bearing depicts a filial relationship, a relationship of a father to a son. And in that relationship, ang tatay ni Seth, si Adam. But Adam is or was created in the image of God and likeness. And so, since Seth is his son, the son also is having that likeness, having that image in him. That significant fact is the first thing stressed when you unfold the biblical revelation of the image concept. Now, itong image concept, pag tinignan natin sa New Testament, sa genealogy again, ito sa genealogy ni Adam, we go to the genealogy of Jesus presented by the historian Luke in chapter 3. In chapter 3, verse 23, Now Jesus Himself began His ministry at about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of David, I, I mean, the son of Joseph. Verse 37, The son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Jesus himself, Adam begot Seth in his own image. He was Adam's son. God begot Adam in his own image. He was God's son. You see, sonship, being in the image of God, being in the likeness of God, they are connected. Luke's genealogy provides a crucial perspective upon the relationship inherent in image bearing. There is a relationship whenever image bearing is being discussed. Kaya nga kung i-apply mo yon and as used in scripture, it is always joined together also with sonship. Image bearing is a filial relationship. So yun ang dapat maging malinaw sa atin, isip. Being in the image of son, of God, being in the likeness of God. That is why 
the Lord Jesus Christ is depicted in that way. For example, in Colossians 1.15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning verse 1. Diba? It's talking about Jesus Christ. But when you go to verse 3, he said, Who being in the light, who being the brightness of his glory, si Jesus, sabi ng author, is the express image of his person. Kung sasabihin mo rin, Jesus Christ is in the image of God, in the likeness of God, kinasabi ng writer, but Jesus also is being called as the Son of God. These two passages delineates, it defines, it highlights, and describes Christ. Ano man describe dito? Did he describe dito yung filial relationship ng ating Panginoon sa Kanyang Ama? And it depicts Him here in these verses as the very image of God. The very image of God is no other than also the Son of God, Jesus Christ Himself. And this is also the reason why Paul, in some sense, spoke about the whole human race, even in sin, said to be sons of God. But here, his use is in the Greek is generic. You remember Acts 17, 28. For in Him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your poets have said, for we are also His, what? The generic sense of being the sons of God is His offspring. We are God's children generically. Okay, that was the use of Paul in Acts 17. Sinners, in other words, continue to be God's offspring naturally. Okay, by virtue of creation, but not spiritually. Okay, James tells us that fallen man retains this aspect of his identity as God's living representation. When he was discussing about the tongue, you remember in James 3.9, with it we bless our God and Father and with it we curse men. We have been made in the similitude of God. And he was, who are made in the similitude of God? Men who are in sin. Men who use their tongue Badly, one time maybe to honor God, to talk about God, to praise God. Even in their sin, they bear His image naturally by virtue of creation. But man in sin no longer represents God accurately. Rather, he misrepresent God morally and spiritually. In fact, the Bible tells us that there is a sense in which sinful man is said to be no longer God's son or image spiritually. You remember the Lord Jesus Christ in addressing his unconverted countrymen? We have been reading John. I told you the whole book of John is showing to us that the Jesus or the Jewish Messiah is no other than Jesus Christ. That's why if you have been read, reading carefully beginning chapter 1 up to ver chapter 8 yesterday, this morning chapter 9, you will notice many, many times is addressing that issue who is Right. 
And when Christ was being attacked by his countrymen, in chapter 8, you remember in verse 44, this is what he said. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. So here, man, because of sin, man in sin is no longer representing God accurately. What he now, the man who says James is still in the similitude of God, is now instead of imaging for his father, is imaging for another father, that's Jesus Christ. Sinong ini-image niya? Your father, the devil. The desires of your father you want to do. So yun yung nakikita sa kanya. Yung desires ng father niya. Sino yung father niya? Yung jablo na, sabi ni Jesus. But that person addressed or the people addressed naturally remains to be in the image of God. No matter how marred that image is, they remain. But spiritually and morally, there is a sense that they no longer represent God accurately. They are no longer God's son. That is what Jesus said. You are no longer God's son. You are the son of the devil. Men in the state of sin are no longer God's spiritual children, but spiritual children of the devil. And because of sin, these Jews were not God's children in every sense when Jesus said that. Sin disrupts the relationship of an image bearer to his God. The filial relationship is destroyed, it is distorted, and even in one sense, abrogated by sin. The tragedy of the fall is personal and relational. Not just moral and legal. Kasi parang, madalas naririnig natin, legal and moral. No, it is also personal and relational. God disinheriting the image of God, which is sinful man. And Jesus is saying, you have become the son of the devil. They were disinherited. You see, that is what that passage is teaching us. That the effect of sin is personal. It is relational. The, there is something gross that happened to you. It's not only that you have failed morally and now you are under some legal bind concerning the law of God. No. It has something to do of your being in the image and likeness of God. But originally, God and man had a special bond that unites them. And that bond is image bearing in the original relationship adam was god's son in every sense in every sense god is man's father creator man is god's creature he is a son a filial relationship exists and so man or adam is a living replica of his god and his father and that is why in conversion, you will notice that the New Testament is saying that the God has become your father. And you have to address him as your father. In conversion, when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, John said in John 1.12, those who have received Christ, what happened to them? They have become the children of God. The children of the devil, says Christ, because they have been rejecting the truth. Now, in Christ, has become the children of God. And today, we who are Christians, 
in every prayer we mouth not only that God is our creator, we acknowledge that. But when we come to Him in Christ, we come to Him as those addressing Him, our Father in heaven. That relationship did not only take place because of what Christ accomplished in the cross, it was existing in that image bearing and likeness when God created us in that likeness, but destroyed and marred by sin. And what is the substance of that original relationship? There are two that the Bible speaks of. And here I will use the term used by my teacher, Greg Nichols, it was a royal sonship, that was his term. And secondly, it was a representative sonship. So what do we mean by that? Ano yung substance? Dapat may substance yung relationship mo. No? The sonship was a very special sonship. Why? Because Adam was not just anybody's son. He was the son of the one who created the heavens and the earth and everything that is on it. He is the sovereign creator. He is the king. And Adam appears to be the prince of that original creation. It is intimated in the bestowal of a status of dominion. Diba? May binigay kay Adam ang Diyos. Genesis 1.28 God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. But we know, by virtue of God being the creator, the entire creation is under Him. He is the King of creation, and that is His dominion. But now, in this verse, Moses is telling us that part of the blessing is that God has given His Son, Adam, dominion over the work of his hands. What are the works of God's son? The face of the sea, the birds of the air, every living thing that moves on the earth will be under now your dominion. You see, God cannot give it to Adam if God does not have that dominion. I like the expression in Psalm 8 verse 3. Beginning verse 3, verse 9. Madalas nating naririnig sa matagal nating pagiging miyembro ng church na ito. A beautiful song. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained. So very obvious thinking about Genesis 1. What is man that you are mindful of him? And the Son of Man that you visit Him. For you have made Him a, lo a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned Him with glory and honor. You have made Him to have what? Dominion over the work of your hands. You have put all things under His feet. You see, Adam was appointed the ruling agent in the created universe. Why would God do that to him? Because he was his son. He wants to give the best to his son. In fact, even the judgment of the last days, the judgment seat, is fully given to the son. And as God is sovereign, so man in a more limited sphere is also sovereign. God made him Lord over the created sphere. 
And Adam was to tend the world God has made. It is to be a rule of care. He has responsibility to develop and cultivate. Malagay ito mga kapatid, as we progress in our theological studies, bakit po? Hindi mo kailangan ng law, hindi mo kailangan na mag-establish ng rule, ng law, para may palabas mo na yung tao responsible. Doon mismo sa actual relationship of a father and son, and when the father has blessed the son, even though he is the son, mas supreme pa rin yung father niya. So nung binigay sa kanya ito, yung dominion na ito, it is to be ruled. And it is to be ruled by him. But it is to be ruled with care. He is, Adam is being given a responsibility to develop and to cultivate the garden. And you would be responsible to the father, what if Adam did not do it well? What do you think? Is he answerable to his father? Yes. You don't need the covenant of law to do it. The relation itself brings about not only privileges, but it also brings about responsibility. And when responsibility is there, then you say, someone seems to be higher. Yes, God. Parang tayo. Yung mga anak ko, they do not need for me to establish law. Our relationship, if I entrust them, son, I want you to help me clean the room. I'll do this, you do that. What happens if he does not do it? I did not say him, I will punish you, I will bless you. If you will, there is no such thing. But the responsibility is there. When, when God gave him, you know, what did God give? Not a law, a blessing. He blessed them. And in blessing them, He gave that dominion. But He will be responsible. All of creation was placed at the disposal of a man and for man to benefit from it. But God is sovereign. Remember that God made him Lord over the created sphere. And this is what Adam is to do. And God expects him to fulfill his responsibility of having dominion. The emphasis in scriptures falls upon the fact that that was given to him because he was God's son. That is the relationship that exists between them. But there is also an equal emphasis upon the fact that the one who gave is the king, is the true sovereign. God, Adam was his father's subject and servant. And being a subject of the father is a position of service, a position of stewardship, a position of accountability. And in the end, we know Adam will be accountable to God as his judge. He is liable to punishment and judgment from his creator and father if he choose not to do his will for him. Hindi mo na kailangan yung pangyayari sa garden na gumawa ng you know, law arrangement ang God. So, sabi na ibang theologian, no, you see there the covenant of work. There's no covenant of work that I'm reading in the passage. There is a relationship, and in that relationship, there is a responsibility. For example, here, if you join this church, you have a responsibility towards us. And if you are to be faithful to that responsibility, then you will not be Reprove. You will not hear anything because you are being faithful. But if not, maybe you will be reminded, first of all, encouraged. 
if you're still hard-headed, you might be reproved by one of the brethren or even by the pastor himself. And if you do not want at all, you don't need to be a member here. That's why if you apply for membership, we tell you at once the responsibilities that you are entering into because you are, why do I have this? Because you're establishing what? A relationship with us. And re re relationship has its privileges, but relationship has also its responsibility. And here, Adam uh, has taken a position of service, a position of stewardship, and accountability in receiving that dominion as one of the blessings of God to him. It's a blessing. Do you find being a follower of Jesus Christ? Do you find the Lordship of Jesus Christ is a too heavy burden to carry? That you only want to think about Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Pero yung Lord, maliit. Savior and Lord. Because Lord entails what? A reminder that you are in a position of service, stewardship, and accountability before Him. And in the end, you would be accountable to, you, to God as His job. We will be accountable for all of our sins. The blessing that we enjoy is that the blood of Jesus Christ will wash it all. Kaya nga, merong mga dangerous teaching na pag hindi naintindihan mabuti, no? Christ has already paid, you know, the price for your sins yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You'll never hear that from me. Many of you have been here, you never heard that from me. Because it's liable to misunderstand it. So I can continue to sin. It, grace so much abounds. So let's continue in sin. Anyway, our future saints have been dealt with. So nagingingat tayo because man logically thinks. And because he logically thinks, he makes unnecessary conclusions and not the conclusion of the scripture. Diba? That's why another very dangerous statement is once saved, always saved. Because man thinks logically, he makes conclusion based on that logic. But what is the substance of that may be different from what the Bible is saying. Because one saved and always saved to me means a person who's still saved will continue and will be preserved as one who continues in holiness. Because he was saved from what? I have not been saved from poverty. I have not been saved from illnesses. Jesus Christ came to save people from their sins. If you do not want to be saved from sin, you don't need Jesus. I will tell you that. You want to get rich? To be a millionaire when you reach 25? There are many good books and successful books that were followed by men who had become millionaires. Yung isang estudyante ko, ganun siya. A 24 millionaire na siya. Sabi niya, tanda mo, magiging millionaire ako sandali. Does he need Jesus? No! You don't need that. But anyone who needs to be delivered from his sin, where can you go? What book will you buy? Tell me, where will you go? There is no place to go. Even other religions are not are saying, you'll never find it here. There is only one who offers to wash away all your sins to the point that 
in the sight of God, it is like looking at something that is from the east and the west. Not stop. Or as if it was in the back of him. Your sin was placed at the back so that whenever God turns, he doesn't see your sinfulness. Because it is at his back. You see the, 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 the picture being used? But we know it is all in Christ. There in that cross, he carried him. So don't think lightly about sin. Why? Because when you begin to think about your sin and what happened to that sin, you look to the cross. That is what happened. Because I sin, a man without sin is on that cross. Die. If that is the way you think, will you continue in sin because grace so much abounds? No way. No way. But don't you ever think, brethren, that you are not liable to God's punishment and judgment. Even Adam, though God was his father, the creator father, if he does not choose to do his will, which later we would learn in the fall, he received God's punishment. But it was also a representative sonship. And with this we will end our study by representative. I mean that Adam, God's son, did not stand before his father as a private person. You see, from the inception of their relationship, Adam was constituted by God as the representative head of mankind. God made Adam the representative head of all his posterity. It was as God's son that Adam represented all humanity. And the New Testament also tells us that. You remember in Romans 5 verse 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. And here Adam is being mentioned as a type of him who was to come. One who is intended to prefigure or to commemorate the other. It is Christ. Adam, as Adam was the head and representative of his race, Paul is saying, so Christ is the head and representative of his people. Kaya nga pagka nagbasa ka sa New Testament, yan yung makikita mo. And so when Adam sinned, that sin also became ours. Not all the sins of Adam. Adam had sinned, I believe, though not mentioned in Scripture, isa lang yung sin. Na nasa lahat ng posterity niya. Yung tinatawag na original sin. The rest of, the, of Adam's sin in his life, how many years he lived, wala naman sa atin yun. You see? And so the primary likeness of Adam to Jesus was that each was the head of their offspring. Christ is the head of all believers. Even as Adam is the head of the human race. Adam and Christ were similar in that each one single act affected their offspring. Naapektuan ba? Oo. Kaya nga, nung finally, meron siyang ginawa that, uh, na may kasamang threat directly. Iba ito. Which we will study next. Ano nangyari? May pek ito sa offspring. 
Tayo yun. Pero yun lang isa na yun yung may effect sa atin. The other sins he committed in his life is not imputed upon us. Only that one sin which later we would study. But ito po yung relasyon na nag exist Kaya nga, what do you see here? So what do you learn from here? Dito, kitang-kita mo, inaayos nito at dapat maging maayos tayong lahat pagdating sa pananaw natin sa tao. Kasi ngayon, ang kaguluhan na umiiral is that. But, if you acknowledge the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, siya yung Diyos mo, eh ito, yung truth na dapat mong panghawakan, ano man ang mangyari. Pero kung iba yung Diyos mo, ay eh iba talaga yung usapan. di ba? Eh kung walang Diyos yung ibang tao, eh mayroon pa nga kausap. Kasi, kung mangyari yun, ano ang batayan mo para sabihin, may magtanong sa'yo, ano ba ang tao? What is the nature of man? What is man? Saan mo kukunin yung sagot? Sa psychology? Sa humanities? Sa observation? Where will you get it? But if you say that your God is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you get the answer here. And whatever other people say to you, you're being deceived. That's what the Bible says. The devil will come to deceive you about this truth. But if he is God, the God that I worship, is, is that it is also your God. Yahweh or Jehovah is your God. Scripture is profitable also for doctrine. Man was originally created by God and no other. Only this God created it. The Bible assumes the existence of Yahweh and it says that everything was created by Him. And as the Creator, everything was with a design and purpose. That image is in the likeness of God. It is in the image of God. Very clear. Tapos sa isang Kristiyano, and they are male and female. Period. Later on, it will touch other issues about labor, sex, marriage, and so forth. But you begin where you should begin. What is man? Before Yabi who created man, man is in his image. What does it mean? God established originally a relationship of sonship. I have a filial relationship with God. God has a fatherly relationship to me. Now that I am a Christian, I relate to this God who is Yahweh as my Father in heaven. By virtue of what His Son accomplished on my behalf. So you see, yan yung magiging perspektibo mo. Ano man ang ituro ng mga eskwela sa mga anak natin, on what man is, you only say repeatedly to Him, this is my God, and I hope this is also the one that will be your God. But this God says, we have been created originally by God to be His sons and daughters, to represent Him, His goodness, His holiness, His morality. In giving the Ten Commandments, we are able to. We are not under the law, and yet, as a Christian, you would say, that everything that is written there is being fulfilled in your life. I will always honor God. I will not take the name of my God in vain. It should never be. If you know what God is and how good God has been to me and how He has blessed me and privileged me in life, 
Why would I do this to God? Why would I take His name in vain? No, I love Him. I will not. I will not have any other God. Why would I? I know that there is one, and the one is the one who created everything in heaven and earth and all that is in it, whether visible or invisible. So you begin to apply it and you begin to thank the Lord Jesus Christ because you know it is only through the Lord Jesus Christ that the blindness that you and I have has been removed. Apart from the light of the gospel, all of us will just invent another God. We'll never find Yahweh there because there's no one seeking after Him. We're seeking after our own God. We make our own God. So when the Bible says, there is no one seeking upon, upon on, on Yahweh, that's true. Who is seeking Yahweh? You don't even know Him. People don't even know Him. Why would they seek Him? Does anyone know who Yahweh is? So, what is the God that they are seeking? It's not the same God. Don't be deceived. The devil is the father of lies and they tell you, as long as each one of us have our God and follow what we have learned about that God, then we arrive at the same place. No. No. There are many Joey here. In fact, there is even a Joey Sarmiento in the Philippines. But he is not me. And I am not him. Maybe same name, but we're different. You see? That is why the only best guide for you and me is always to return back to scriptures because what the devil is trying is not for you to be morally wrong in your life. The greatest danger I face and I believe that each of you face it, living in this world is deception. Period. Deception to be deceived. And saying, God, no. You mean any God will send, will judge us? What kind of God is He? What? You see? They say that because they do not know that God is righteous and just. And it is, if God is just, of course, He will punish you and He will send you to hell. But when people do not know who, who this God is, they say so many absurd things. I just listen to them. And I pray that God will give me an opportunity like the Apostle Paul in Marseille. Let me declare to you this God that you do not know. Where would you get it? In your Bible. Always return there. Because it is there that you will find the truth. And Jesus Christ says, it is also there that you will find me. The only begotten Son of God. And so be thankful. That's the way God is. I would always say, indeed, God has been good ever since to those whom he created the only reason why people go to hell is because of their rejection of the goodness of God and what is the highest good that God has shown to us sending his only begotten son I cannot do that I cannot offer the life of my daughter, any one of my two daughters, to any sinner, for whatever reason. They're not worthy. Why would I? You only find Yahweh doing that. The ultimate good that he did was to send his only begotten son for you. And for me. Why would you reject Jesus Christ? Why would you reject what God offers to you free? Answer that yourself. Why have you been rejecting what God is offering? Is there anything bad 
unjust in what God offers to you? He offers to you His Son. There is no other one in this world that would just do that. But our Father in heaven did that. And it is only but right that one day when God returns again to judge both the living and the dead, to send those who rejected His offer of salvation through the life of His only begotten Son to be punished forever and ever. May it not befall any one of you here because in the goodness of God He has been telling you the truth and never a lie. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the truth that you have given to us. And may you help us, Lord, see, hear, and know properly that which we need to know and to understand. For this world is trying to distort it. This world is trying to introduce so many things on it. And sometimes your people like Eve are taking the lies and the deceptions that others are offering to us. And even as Christians, we acknowledge to you, Father, we are still receiving so much deception on the most basic teachings and scripture. Oh, may it be that in this church, not a single member will give in to these lies and to these deceptions that we are hearing and sometimes hearing from those who say they too are Christians. Help us, Lord, to have a very strong Berean spirit. Though listening to what others are saying, even this man standing here, we will take the responsibility to go to the Word that is available to us. And through your Spirit, may you show clearly, Father, the truth so that the errors will fade away in his mind. It will never reach his heart. Teach us continually our Father about your Son and about the teachings of your Son that we too in the process of time may be like Him for this is our prayer in Jesus Christ's name Amen